In the beginning, there was one, and there was chaos. In Egyptian mythology, this is called Nu. In Hebrew, it's called Tahu Vavo. In Hinduism, we have a text from the Rig Veda which reads, Darkness there was at first, by darkness hidden. Without distinctive marks, all this was water. That which, becoming by the void, was covered. The one by force of heat came into being. In Christian mysticism, according to Yakuburma, the Christian mystic we've chosen to use for this exposition, there was a dark, embryonic, amorphous abyss. In science, according to physicist Lawrence Krauss, there was a quantum vacuum, a void filled with quantum fluctuations. In Greek, it is called chaos. But chaos isn't exactly the correct translation. It's more like emptiness, vast void, chasm, abyss, a gap, a gape, or an opening space, an expanse of air. In alchemy, the primeval chaos is imagined as a formless congestion of all elements. From this chaos, or co-eternal, coterminous, or prior to said chaos, emerges mat in Egypt, which represents truth, balance, order, harmony, law, morality, and justice. Epirion in Greece, the divine substance from which all is generated and to which all shall return. In Pythagoreanism, hen, the number one. Similarly, in Neoplatonism and Neopythagoreanism and Gnosticism, we find the monad, the one which is beyond being, which emanates the rest of the universe. In Taoism, you have the Tao, which produces Wuji, the limitless or infinite, Wu, meaning without or isn't, and Ji, the highest utmost point, to reach the end, to attain or to exhaust. In Kabbalah, we speak of the Ein Sof, again, Ein, without, Sof, end, or Atzmut, which, like in Sufism, emanates what is described metaphorically as a light called Or Ein Sof, the light of the Ein Sof, or nur i Ahadi, the light of the One, in Sufism, which desires to manifest itself in multiplicity, coming out of its self-isolated oneness, Zahat of Allah, the Divine Essence. But one is a lonely number, the one desired to know and to love. It is a desire that begets creation. In Buddhism, for example, although they don't speak of creation, it is tanha, thirst or desire, that begets the endless cycle of death and rebirth, known as samsara. According to many a mystic, God is moved by the desire to reveal themselves to themselves, a desire for self-awareness, the ultimate mystery striving to know herself. The desire to manifest itself draws itself out of its hidden loneliness. The craving arouses the becoming of the other, for without her there is nothing but itself, whom it can know and love. The desire for the other by the one, which has no other, is also spoken of by the Kabbalists as Sha'ashuei HaMelech Ba'atzmo, the delight of the king with himself, the autoerotic stirrings within Ein Sof, and is likewise found in the Egyptian myth, where Atum creates a plethora of gods through an act of autoeroticism with the female principle within him. There is a necessity for the other, because consciousness arises only through opposition. Consciousness is always consciousness of something. Self-consciousness only arises through the encounter with otherness. Nothing may be revealed to itself without opposition, writes the Christian mystic Yaku Burma. If God is a conscious being, then something that is, so to say, not God must stand opposed to it. God requires creation to become conscious. For genuine self-revelation, God must express themselves as a being who may freely choose either to love themselves or to reject themselves. Only a being as such is truly independent, truly an other to God. So in order to create space for the other, the one retracted into itself, temporarily forgetting him, her, your, our, myself, whereby creating an empty space that would allow the illusion of another in its own image, the requirement for a dream, the womb of creation, because if you're taking up all the space in your universe, there's no room for a relationship with another. You must make space for love. In Egyptian mythology, the gods give rise to the sun, typically represented by the god Ra, whose birth forms an empty space of light, 
and dryness within the dark water. In Kabbalah, particularly that of Isaac Luria, whose anniversary we just commemorated, this process is called Tzimtzum, contraction. This act of contracting, retracting, concealing, and hiding is also called Helem, and continues to occur through the process of creation, as we shall see. In Hinduism, we find a similar idea of Maya. In Christianity, it is described as God drawing into itself, a retreat to the center, an act of contraction, or clearing of a space, kenosis. The light contracted into darkness, leaving only an infinitesimally small point of light, eager to expand into the darkness. This act of contraction followed by emanation can also be seen as a divine death and rebirth, which leads us to another mythic element which overlaps here, but a different metaphor for death and birth is used, that of tearing apart or disintegrating, followed by a reconstitution, spiragamos as it's known in the Greek. In Greco-Roman mythology, we have this idea of a dying and resurrecting god, death represented by winter and rebirth by the spring. The plant or seed that dies and ruts in the fertile ground as a prerequisite to being reborn, representing the cycle of death, resurrection, reincarnation, and immortality. The imagery and ritual surrounding this myth is the tearing apart, the dismembering of the beast or the god who is scattered and then reunited, whose body often then becomes the objects from which the universe is built. As we see in other myths such as the Norse myth of Ymir or the Chinese myth of Pangu, who emerged from the cosmic egg which coalesced from the primordial formless chaos, Pengu then separated yin from yang, heaven from earth, and when he dies, his body becomes all the parts of the world. In Hinduism, as told by Alan Watts, we have the Atma Yajna, the act of self-sacrifice whereby God gives birth to the world. Prajapati, Vishnu, or Brahma creates the world by an act of self-dismembering or self-forgetting, whereby the one becomes many, a single actor playing multiple parts. When the play comes to an end, she wakes up to find herself again, only to begin the play once more the one dying into the many, and the many dying into the one. As it is written in the Upanishads, then he realized, I, indeed, I am this creation, for I have poured it forth from myself. In that way, he became his creation.